Hello. Now, uh, I'm going to change the pace a bit here. It's not, I'm gonna, not going to show you the massively cool stuff that we have in Edge because all of you use Macs, so it's pointless. And uh, um, I also don't want to talk about all the cool new ongoing technology stuff because you can see that anywhere where you're going anyways. I want to talk about um, a bit of a change that happened to me and especially going back to the roots of uh, State of the Browser where we had different browser vendors sitting here telling us what's coming next and what we're doing for developers and developers throwing abuse at us. And uh, I want to talk about the change that happened to me when I moved from Mozilla to Microsoft when out of a sudden I realized that there's this huge group of developers out there that don't go to, see, to these events, that don't read the coolest blog posts, but build things that people need every day. You know, like boring things like cache points or like the tracking software of interstellar missiles, missiles or, um, you know, insurance companies, these people that do the day-to-day -day web work that we actually see as boring, but use every single day. So uh, talking to enterprise developers, I always thought it was Star Trek, but it's actually boring. And, uh, but I realized that we have a lot of things going on that we think the web is doing and we think browsers should be doing, but I learned much more that working on a browser now and on a browser with clients that build things with the browser, that we have a very limited view of what the browser is doing and as developers, we don't even understand just how much work we need to be doing and we need to understand. So I was thinking about what can we do in terms of tooling to make this better. So what is the purpose of a browser? When I talk to myself, in, uh, which I do a lot, in like 1997, 1998, when the IE6 thing died and other browsers came along, basically it was three simple things. It should render web content. It should show multimedia content, which was already a problem with like this, this, uh, this video is not playable in your computer and these kind of things. And it follow and inspire web standards. I think we can agree that this is what browsers should be doing or this was browsers was the good thing about them. This was about the time when the internet looked like that. This is what the browsers should be able to do. And I'm getting very tired of people having this limited view of what a browser is nowadays, because a browser is, to me, not only an uh, interface for end users, but also a software platform. You use it inside things like Electron, you use it in like WebView apps that we had in, in 10,000 versions of Windows and in Firefox OS and these kind of things. So it, it, they're very complex pieces of software, and it's not only the things that we as web developers care about that browser vendors have to deal with. There's so much more happening right now, especially in the changed ubiquitous web that we have right now. We have the IoT, we've got laptops, we've got desktops, we've got tablets, we've got mobile phones, we've got voice interaction in browsers, we've got VR stuff going on. So as a browser vendor, you have to, to follow all these things and you have to understand all of them. And at the same time, you have to standardize them so you work with other browser makers and you also have to deal with different clients with different needs. So, the job of a browser, to me, changed drastically over the time that we had the web. And we always think it's, we should push around the same things and say, like, ooh, Chrome does this, you should do this as well. Safari does this, you should do this as well. Well, it's not a standard yet. It's a pseudo-standard. There's no such thing as a pseudo-standard. That's just a stupidity to me. So a browser needs to show web and multimedia content fast and reliably. And this is fun when you think about it, like, oh, cool. We, I remember when the first internet things were... And then the JPEG started loading, and I'm like, half an hour later, I'm like, it's a flower, isn't it? And now you see like, people like, oh, yeah, well, iPads don't play MP4 files or, or other video files, so I put a 14 Mac GIF in there because it's funny. <laughs> and when the browser uses like half your RAM because it renders a GIF that has been resized from this to there, it's the browser's fault. Give access to the web regardless of ability. Like, browsers have to talk to assistive technology and have to actually talk to the operating system that makes assistive technology be able to turn something on the web to something readable, hearable, or understandable. We have to turn, uh, allow users to turn off animations, to, do, uh, uh, to support a high contrast view. We have to keep users safe by blocking unsafe content and patch attack vectors. We're all like, okay, cool, cool, we got our ad blockers. But the amount of stuff that can be going wrong in browsers, Internet Explorer 6, 7, 8 had this great opportunity for JavaScript tinkerers that any PNG file with embedded JavaScript would, it would, ex, uh, would execute that JavaScript, which of course is great if you want to put a Bitcoin miner into somebody's Twitter account. 
So we also had to, Twitter resized our image by one pixel to make sure that actually code embedded would not be executed and these kind of things. Every time we create a new standard and we create something amazing, the terrible people of the web will use it first. Developers will, will say it's not ready yet or we need an editor for it or something like that. I've seen about 40 different ways how to abuse web USB in terms of getting access to the computer. I haven't seen a sensible demo yet that really uses web USB for something good. Rem uh, browsers have to remember users' history and access their credentials, or remember nothing. You have to have a private browsing mode, which is always a quite euphemism. We know what it's used for. <laughs> Buying presents for your girlfriend so she doesn't know that you bought it, so it's not in your history. I don't know what you thought. <laughs> but also, typing into something on my mobile phone is terribly annoying. Having an autocomplete for my emails, for my credit card numbers, for my, uh, for my telephone numbers, for my address is great unless only I get access to that, not somebody else with some random ad in a third-party JavaScript in the page. Allow for detailed customization, including extensibility. People want to change their browser to what they need. They want to have extensions on their browser, and extensions are the best way to get malware into a browser. And even extensions to developer tools had that problem in Chrome. You also want to sync content across a range of devices. You don't want to go to your mobile phone and start surfing and go to your desktop and keep going on surfing. But you don't want that data to be stored anywhere. So how should that happen? Now, you, know, you can use audio API to use non-detectable uh, uh, non sound to actually send data from one computer to another. But let's not do that. And browser makers have audiences with different needs. Everybody as a web developer, and I myself had that thought, like, we should be the ones you care most about. Not really, because we're not the ones that bring them money. End users that click on their services inside their browsers make them money. Nobody makes money with a browser. Guess what they do? You, you, you do a search in the browser, a certain search engine is used, and that brings the money in. So consumers of the web are basically the biggest group we have out there. The people that just expect their data to be safe when they put it in a browser. The people just expect images to be loaded. The people just expect things to load fast, even if it's like 12 auto-playing ads in there and a parallax scrolling unicorn in the background in WebGL turning. Creators of web content are another audience as well. People want to make sure that they actually can create stuff for the web and it will not break in a new browser because we've done that since 1997 and it shouldn't be any different. Web developers, of course, extension developers, app developers, and IT departments. That's one of my biggest problems working for Microsoft. You get like, all excited about what we have in Edge, and then you go to a company, and they're like, yeah, we only have Windows 7. We didn't upgrade to 10. Why? Because it was free? No, we, we, we just didn't have time to upgrade that. The other day, I worked for a hardware maker, and we pressed a button, and we updated 1.2 million computers in England to Windows 10, and that's a really good feeling. And there was seven months of our work to be able to do that, to convince them that it's actually a better way to save money by having a better operating system that is better maintained. The other thing browsers need to do is be forgiving. Anyone is allowed to write code for the web, and that's great or use whatever they want to create that code. Yes, you can use a, a front page 1997 to still make a website, and we have to render that shit for you. <laughs> yes, the Space Jam website still exists. It has a link down there that says accessibility, that says, like, please tell us when something's wrong, because we don't know how to make it accessible. And we still show it as the coolest thing that works since then. Whatever goes wrong, it's the browser's fault. That's always the thing. We love to point out to the browser, that's probably the browser doing it wrong. And you're like, you've got 12 animated GIFs on this page. You know, inside a parallax rotating in a cube. Why do you think that is slow? <laughs> Users shouldn't suffer from developer errors. That's why JavaScript, uh, that's why HTML and CSS have always been forgiving. Like, when you do something wrong, it goes on with it. JavaScript, you do one line wrong, it's just like, that's the end of the world, fuck you, I don't want to work with you anymore. <laughs> Legacy products will never get fixed. That's the other problem as well. Out, outdated browsers will be out there and they're not getting replaced no matter how free and open your browser is. And you can't break the web. The browsers are the ones that have to be backwards compatible in everything that they do. So when we innovate things, we have to make sure we innovate them and leave them. We can never take them away from you again because then you get things like uh, the, the, all the CSS uh, um, substitution we had to do in Edge to make the web not break that basically were wrongly done in Safari and then fixed in Chrome, but we still had to support all of them because people keep using them and they don't get maintained. So that created a messy web. 
The web has become a render target amongst many others. It's not people writing HTML, CSS, optimizing everything and then putting on their FTP and finding it out there. No, we just basically use 12 different libraries, press a button and hope everything works. And when we got 6,000 diffs in each other, it works, doesn't it? Who cares? Releasing often and developer convenience trumps semantics and performance of the final product. It was fun earlier when we looked at the divs of what the Twitter interface does. So? The Twitter interfaces change every two days. They don't want to make that thing maintainable. They don't care about the semantics. They don't care about the new feature coming in that makes sure that terrible people can talk to each other about racism or whatever the purpose of that thing is. So websites are slow and huge because they work on fast computers and good connections. We have these great connections, we have these great computers, so the things work great on our machines and then we end users, they should just buy new computers, right? This is a quad-core i9 machine with 32 gig of RAM. The web looks good for now. Next week is probably slow. Being a web expert is less exciting than being a full-stack developer. I've been a lot of conferences in the last years, and it gets less and less interesting to talk about cool web semantics and what CSS can do, but like, okay, you're a full-stack developer. You can be your, your Facebook founder tomorrow just by using these five libraries. People get super excited about running server to rendering and, and, and not understanding any of in between, between, as, in between as long as it's fast. So how is it possible that the web is in this terrible state with all the great resources we have? We've got developermozilla.org, we've got caniuse.com that tells us what, what each browser can do and how it can be fixed if not. We've got Visual Studio Code and Atom and other hackable editors that are written in TypeScript. So if I want to fix them, I use the language that I use them for to fix the right, well, it's open source. But web developers, I think, need to know a lot these days and a lot more than we give ourselves credit for. We always say, like, okay, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, that's all it is. What is even JavaScript nowadays? You can do everything with JavaScript. So web developers need to know the performance of the website, how to make a performing website on a mobile phone, on a desktop device, on a HoloLens, wherever you want to run it. They need to know about accessibility. They need to know that a button should be a button, and if a button is not a button, it might not be available to the end user. They need to know interoperability. They need to know that that cool thing that is in this week's nightly build of Firefox is probably not going to be available for another two years in the other browsers, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't rely on. They know, need to know about security. Even a blank target on a link is a security vulnerability nowadays. You gotta even look at the old HTML stuff and make sure you're not doing something wrong and you give something an opportunity to inject things. Internet Explorer used to have these filters in CSS that were basically active X controls inside your, inside your CSS, getting you full access to the graphics hardware, getting you full access to the machine. Houdini filters could do the same thing, but we learned from the mistakes that we did before. So every time we make something very interactive, we also can make it very insecure. We have to make things maintainable. The next developer needs to read your stuff and understand what you've been doing and actually making sure that they don't need to be as clever as you are to maintain the thing, because if you don't, then it's going to be a mess. I remember I did visit Britain.com back then. That was 127,000 pages in 73 languages. It was 14 templates in the content management system. The CSS was 300 lines of CSS. It was not much CSS that was supported back then. I left the company, half a year later, 4,600 lines of CSS with like heading blue left aligned as class names and things like that. So the maintainability is something that we never think about, but we should. And that's only when it comes to building things for our end users. When it comes to being developers ourselves, we need to know about browser quirks, which browser messes up how. We need to know developer tool chains, what is broccoli, whatever tooling out there, you know, what kind of language do you use now. Uh, we need to know browser developer tools, like what can Firefox do, what can Chrome do for me, what can Edge do for me, what can Safari do for me. We need to know abstractions. Why is less not important anymore? Why is it SAS now? Why is it now Houdini? Why, is, why are all these things not the native CSS anymore? And we know the command line interface nowadays. The amount of times I hear, like, to be a CSS developer, you need to go to the Unix terminal. And I'm like, what? <laughs> but we do. We have all these build tools that basically make us more effective, but we need to understand them. And we need to know about editors, which is the most best editor and how to, how to customize it for yourself to be more efficient. This is a lot to ask for just a web developer. Our world has become much more complex than it used to be. So where do you learn that? Standard documentation? Well, if, if you suffer from insomnia, it's a great thing to read through. Browser vendor docs, cool, they're there, but they might be, they might be skewed towards a certain browser's ideas and their business models. Conferences, sure, but it doesn't scale. 
this is affordable, it's great that you're here, but not everybody can go to a conference and has to beg their boss to actually get free time to go to conferences. Books, outdated by the time they come out. Workshops, even more time, even more expensive. Developer tools, great, they're in the browser, they do there, but again, they differ from one to another. And I switch between browsers, that costs me time and it, it costs me cognitive overhead because I'm switching my mental model. News channels, uh, good luck with that. <laughs> so, what learning obstacles do we have as web developers? We have resources with upvoting options that favor the how over the why. That's your stack overflows, that's your W3C schools, W3 schools kind of thing. Like, all these solutions are never the answer and what the thing does, it's just like, do this and believe me. <laughs> and you're like, okay, and that's why we mess things up with copy and paste development. We're not paid to learn, we're paid to deliver. Especially in a startup environment, you're not there to actually learn your trade. You, by the time you actually go through the interview, you're supposed to be the lead engineer. And by, they ask you like three whiteboard questions to, quest, to test what you know and never seen you in production or whatever. Peer pressure makes developers who don't know things afraid to admit it. I hate that at JavaScript conferences when people are like, who here uses this kind of new API? Yeah, sure, for five weeks now. Nobody in the audience uses it, but nobody wants to be seen as the person who's not as cool as the others, and we're doing that to ourselves. That's stupid. There's always a good enough way to create a lot of short, in a short amount of time. Use Bootstrap. These kind of answers, you know? Let's do that. So what do we do? We take shortcuts. And this is where, where it gets really painful when I see, for example, AMP. People on the web standards love to rant about AMP, about being a terrible idea and about being that like, oh, when I optimize it by hand, I'm actually faster than the AMP page. Yeah, but these are people who just want to deliver things. They, 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 they don't want to know about these things. I'm not a fan of it either, but I understand that it was, there was a need to make a performing thing and they didn't want to learn through all the things because most of our documentation when it comes to make, make a mobile performant HTML page is like, Watch these four videos, each one hour long, that all disagree with each other how to do it properly. So, or use that thing that Google says it's the right thing to do. Tooling presets, uh, presets is another issue. Like, okay, here's the thing that, like, this build script creates these 5,000 things and then does the tree shaking and does the code splitting and makes it much easier for you as well. But it's still a two meg overhead for, like, a diff that says hello world. But it's for, uh, to make a tool and to give it not a preset is a really hard thing to do because people don't want to spend time uh, customizing the tool. Abstractions, libraries and frameworks of course a big thing as well and hoping nobody cares is another big thing as well. Because if it runs fast on your, on your boss's computer, who cares about the end users, right? So there's issues with current tooling that I have and other people had as well. First of all, there's too many promises. This tool makes $x easy, no need to look it up. This is always the thing that always cracks me up, like accessibility is easy if you use this library and you're like, no. But it's a message that is great because uh, people who just spend money on engineering basically love this kind of stuff. Huge Corp app uses this configuration and tool chain. If it works for their needs, you should rock for you. it should rock for you too. Facebook uses React, probably that website you're making for that florist should use React as well. Using this configuration optimizes for the modern web. That's what pisses me off the most. The expression, the modern web, is the most nonsensical thing I know. What is the modern web? The modern web used to be, uh, used to be filters in CSS in Internet Explorer 6. The modern web used to be Flash. The modern web used to be like, whatever. It's like modern is, is a thing that's moving so fast. It's a very good headline. It sells you things, but it's a very stupid thing to say because the modern of today becomes the, uh, the security bug of tomorrow. There's too many rules and barriers for us to start thinking things. Opinionated tools demand you to fix things that don't apply to your product. Like, to get 100% in this testing tool, you need to have an, a, a, a web worker, a, a service worker, and a manifest, because otherwise you're not PWA compatible. Well, I'm, using, I'm building an internet page. It doesn't have to be PWA compatible. I never need a service worker for anything. But the tool tells me, unless I do that, I don't go through the build script, it doesn't get live. Dependencies and complex tool chains can be daunting. It's like, okay, learning these kind of things, especially by the time when somebody says, that's the coolest thing ever, and then I'm on the plane, it takes me four or five days, and by the time I get time to look at it, their next blog post is like, don't use that, it's not good enough anymore. And you're like, what am I doing here? Best practices often don't get updates and are contextual. What's a best practice for Google or for Microsoft is not a best practice for Facebook, for Twitter, or for other people, or for Walmart. Having to follow strict rules without understanding them is not fun. 
you need to set this on your server to have that broadly compression and this kind of thing, and you're like, why? Well, otherwise you don't follow, otherwise it's not a modern web kind of thing. So you don't want to feel stupid by using a tool. So how can we accelerate that learning? And that's something that I've been working on, on uh, a lot lately, especially with, with partners, with clients that have like nine to five developers, what, uh, what we keep calling the black hole developers that nobody ever sees. They just go into the office, build code for nine hours and go home and never go to any conference, never read any blog posts, never care about that. They just want to do their job. So I think the customizable uh, best practices in context is the only way we can reach those people and we can make ourselves much happier as well. So what does that mean? Having information isn't enough when people don't go there. It's great that we have the MDN web docs, but if you don't have time to look things up and you basically just want to have it in your editor, you should have it in your editor. We need to prevent mistakes before they happen. So debugging is great. Linting before you do something stupid, typing something in and it get a squiggly red line under it, that's a good thing too, because then you don't have to go through the debugging process and you have to understand what debugging is as well. Much like having a, uh, having a spell checker in, in Word is great because while I'm typing thing, it tells me this, this sounds stupid, that's a mistake. And uh, we should do the same with code. We need to allow people to customize these experience. An internet site, for example, needs different settings than a marketing site. And let's target editors, I think, and build processes. We have all these cool build processes. We've got our Webpack, we've got our, our grunt, gulp, broccoli, fart, whatever. So let's, let's make sure that the best practices that we have on the web and what leads to good outcome is part of these things. So linting and inline insights into editors is a great thing. I love that I write CSS in Visual Studio Code and it tells me up there, these are all the things that are wrong. And if I disagree with some of them, I can change the, the, uh, the JSON uh, notification of my linter and say, like, don't tell me about that. I know it's wrong for some, it's good for me. So you can turn those things off. So, one thing that we put together is WebHint.io, which used to be called SonarWall, and there was a copyright issue, and there was Sonar, there was another copyright issue, and we don't know what WebHint is going to be. But right now it's WebHint.io. And there you can go and put a URL in, and it does all the checking for you. So, this sounds like a magical thing, but bear with me, because it actually follows to the things that I just said. So what you do is you do example.com, which I think, after all the time that we've done on the web, should be error-free, right? It's only a, web, it's a white web page saying example.com on it. But if you look through it, we actually found an accessibility error, we found interoperability errors, we found two performance errors, we found PWA error and, a and two security warnings just in that URL. And the great thing about that tool is not it just tells you like you've done something wrong, but you can click through it and it explains to you what the things are wrong. So interoperability, it didn't have the UTF-8 header on the client side, it expected the browser to do it right. And some mobile browsers don't do the UTF-8 uh, configuration for you, which means the text is being displayed wrongly. And it also allows you to inject things into form fields that you shouldn't be able to inject if the, uh, if the font setting hasn't been done properly. And then when you click through the even more details, then it explains to you why this is a problem, why it is important, how to fix it, and where to find more documentation around it. And this is the thing that I miss a lot in a lot of other these tools. They say, like, it's wrong, but why? Well, you're stupid enough, to, you're not clever enough to know it's, it, it, how to fix it kind of thing. Of course, I ran stateofthebrowser.com, and I have to say, we have no accessibility errors. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we got a few interoperability, a PWA, performance, and security. But there's the interesting thing. Why should I care? What if I don't care about PWA? I, I still have the like, terrible report that I can't show to my boss because there's two errors in there. Because like, oh, you didn't do it right then. So you can, you can actually uh, configure all of that. And even more important, you can hint during deployment. So instead of having this just a website where you have to go and type the URL in, in your build script, you can put WebHint in, in. You can also put uh, uh, Google stuff in there as well if you wanted to. And it becomes part of your, of your continuous integration. It becomes part of your building. So WebHint is node-based, so you can install it as a, party, as a part of your build deployment process. And it can also give you detailed information about the setup of your bundler pre-processed to avoid huge release sizes. So if you use a, a Webpack, and out of a sudden you realize you've got like 3 meg of JavaScript and you don't know why, uh, WebHint also analyzes that part of the development process, not only the HTML, CSS, and the JavaScript that get generated, to optimize that view. So again, it's just, yeah, it's just an, a, a node module. You say hint example.com, you get the message out there, and you can generate an HTML uh, report, a, CSS, uh, uh, a CVS report, or just in this case, show it in the terminal. 
We've built this mostly for third-party companies that build stuff for us. And we told them, like, we cannot release this because it's insecure. And they're like, how is it insecure? And now we send them just these reports. So you got hints on performance, accessibility, PWA readiness, development environment, interoperability, and security. You can, not, you can set them any way you want to. So if your environment does not need the PWA readiness, you can change the uh, configuration and say, like, I don't want that test. Please don't show that to me. So you customize the hint yourself, and you can develop them yourself. This is a guided thing inside Node. If, you're, uh, if you just go on the, uh, uh, in the Node thing right now, and you say, like, create a new hint, that GIF doesn't work. But it basically gives you a yes, no question. Is this part of this? Is this part of that? Is this part of that? What are the rules you want to test? What, what, is the, what, what are your tests? And what is the message at the end? So you can customize them to your need. So I think this is a great way to create a better web independent of browser or OS, because we have one resource that does all these cool resources that we have. We're using X for the accessibility stuff. We're using SNCC for the security things. And we made it available and readable and understandable to you in one sim single tool. It's, uh, you can create detailed reports for third party products about broken issues. You can customize your hinting to allow it to your needs. You can op uh, and it's open source. So it's not a Microsoft product. It's actually from the JavaScript Foundation. We donated that because we don't want to be that people like, oh, I hate it because it's Microsoft. Fine. And that's all I had. So take a look at that. Think about what we need to know as JavaScript, uh, as web developers. And think about, do you want to spend all the time learning all these things or have a testing tool that explains you what's going wrong while you're writing code? Thanks very much.